<laughs> yes. The, the all about that engine featuring the idiots. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, welcome to the Hermes podcast. Um, today we have um, you know some of the propulsion team members here on the fluids and, and prop side. Um, love to get to learn a lot about the engine um, and talk about you know where we're at, uh, where we're going uh, with Chimera uh, and the future. But before we get started there, I'd like to start the intro. So I'll go straight across from me. Eric, take it away. All right, I'm Eric Danbeck. I am one of the lead propulsion engineers here, responsible for the Chimera engine. Uh, prior to my time here at Hermes, I'm here coming on six months. Very <laughs> exciting. Uh, I was at Blue Origin working on the BE4 engine and then SpaceX working on Dragon Propulsion. And Glenn and I actually go way back to our, our right. days at, uh, at Purdue where we got to really get our hands dirty working on some rocket propulsion engines. That's right. Now, uh, Eric, though, you were at SpaceX for how many years? Eight years. So that's basically torturing yourself. If you get through SpaceX with eight years, you got to be doing something right, right? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, we were getting ready to send people to space. That, that gets you going. That's right. And now pretty soon we'll be sending people hypersonically. That's right. That's right. Cool. Yeah, well, I'm Noah. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half now, um, uh, working on fluids and mechanisms on quarter horse. Um, uh, before this, I was at SpaceX, uh, working mostly on Falcon 9 in uh, in-house components, um, and worked a little bit on Crew Dragon uh, on the low flow prop system as well. Um, uh, yeah, been having a lot of fun here. Well, Noah left out a, a key part, though. He's leading up. The vehicle fluids and oh, mechanisms yeah, team. Man. He's not just working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so everything falls on him. Yeah. So as much fun as the prop system is, though, it's, uh, if, uh, you know, without the, the fuel and the right pressures, flow rates, and temperatures, the uh, engine's not going to do much. That's all on your shoulders. Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> Alex? Oh, uh, yeah. So Alex Miller, senior propulsion engineer here at Hermes. Um, also been here about a year and a half, started just after uh, after Noah started. Uh, so before Hermes, I was at Georgia Tech working on my PhD, uh, did a lot of work in experimental combustion, um, having to do with afterburners, bluff body stabilized flames, fuel injection, also a lot of fun with lasers and high speed diagnostics. And uh, so here at Hermes, a responsible engineer for the RAM burner hardware. Um, and for those of you not familiar with what RAM burner means, uh, that's a, a single piece of hardware that functions uh, both as uh, a ramjet combustor when we're flying at high Mach numbers, but then simply as a an afterburner when we're flying at lower Mach numbers in uh, in turbojet mode. Um, so also a responsible engineer for the test site, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, I have a lot of history in testing combustion devices, um, so really happy that I get to do that here at Hermes. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. And again, the disclaimer to all our listeners out there that uh, there's some technical jargon here. Uh, if you don't like <laughs> it, get out. <laughs> uh, as for myself, uh, Glenn Case, probably the Least important person here is a CTO. Uh, these guys are the guys that do all the, the fancy fun work. I don't get to do as much fun work anymore, but uh, in prior life, I got to do some of that. Um, again, rockets into my background, um, you know, Blue Origin, uh, about a half decade or so, uh, working in the BE3 uh, PM as well as some BE4. Uh, prior to that, I was at NASA for a good bit of time down at Stennis Space Center working really large rocket engines in the waning years of the Space Shuttle main engine. J2X and the like. Uh, but yes, as Eric mentioned, uh, we were, I, I, matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and jump into one of my personal stories of the first, the, the question I always ask folks when they come in to hire, uh, when they interview is, uh, tell me about a time you blew something up. And while I, while I have more than one answer to that myself, uh, the first time I really blew something up was I was actually working as Eric's like assistant. Yeah, he, he got to be my technician because <laughs> yeah. we needed more hands. It yeah. was great. Um, so oh, man, the tables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> I still uh, trust his hands a little bit more than I trust mine, so that's okay. <laughs> and um, so we were running this uh, this engine. I believe it was uh, uh, Vincent's uh, small little um, uh, thruster or whatnot. And um, it was like a platelet design or something like that, I recall. But uh, anyways, we, we lit it for the first time. It was there one frame in the camera, and the next frame in the camera, it was not there. And I just remember all training goes out the window that first time <laughs> something blows up, and you just you just freeze for a second. You just let it come in, let that fear consume you for a little bit. 
and then you move on. And after you've had that first, uh, you know, time where you've blown something up and you have that kind of emergency, everything else uh, just doesn't seem quite as, uh, uh, well, I guess, rouse an emotional uh, <laughs> response out of you. But, but those were some good times back in the day. But beyond that, though, uh, you know, I am getting back to my um, air breathing uh, roots, if you would, uh, the... Uh, formal training, though, was in uh, the air breathing uh, back in the day. Eric, you remember what Purdue, I was doing a lot of the Rolls-Royce supersonic uh, quiet uh, business jet that they were d- developing at the time. So it's fun getting back in the, the air aircraft world of things. But enough of that. Let's talk about Chimera. Um, who wants to jump it off? Eric. <laughs> All right. Well, I got nominated. So as most people probably know, we're doing a, a turbine-based combined cycle. So we're building our custom... Uh, engine around uh, a J85. We've got uh, a bunch in the back. Marty in the past has shared those on the Hermius uh, website. So if anybody wants to take a look at those engines, they they can take a peek. And we're making our uh, essentially a custom, uh, I guess you would say, Airflow device to go around the <laughs> the, the turbine. It's adequately uh, generic. Jet, yes, <laughs> our bypass system. Yes, also, yes, yes. it's a bypass system um, where we've got the you know the the hot subsonic air that after it's been shocked down going into our inlet, uh, and then it'll flow through the turbojet and then ultimately go to Alex's uh, ram burner. Uh, when we're operating in basically afterburner mode for the turbojet for probably, I'd say, like half of the, the trajectory. And then the other half is when we transition, we close off flow to the turbojet, have it bypass around, and we get to have fun operating just at ramjet mm-hmm. so that we can actually get up and try and touch Mach 5. So lots of interesting problems, um, lots of a, a, a beast of an engine that it's going to ultimately end up being. But I'm sure we're going to have a, a great time breaking things as we learn. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm sure That's Alex definitely. is looking forward to that because all of us also are in, in the position where we're like, we like to make fire. Yeah. And as long as the fire is coming out the right direction, we're right. doing OK. <laughs> right. It, it's certainly one of the more challenging things to do is, you know, developing your own propulsion system. It's one of the things where we've jumped off from a lot of our other, um, you know, near peers, if you would. Um, in developing our own propulsion system. But in order to do that, you know, you can't just go down the street and test these things at, you know, uh, Testo Mart. Uh, you know, uh, we've chosen the path of developing our own test site. And Alex, you might want to comment a little bit on, on uh, the funds and trials and tribulations of that. Uh, developing a test site. Yeah, that's definitely been a fun adventure. Um, I'm definitely going to ask you to tell a couple of stories here, too. I think one of the most uh, interesting things that you uh, don't think about at the test site is uh, since we're kind of off the grid out there, it's a lot of the <laughs> he knows what's coming. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of the fun challenges with developing the test site are how do you actually support humans operating off the grid? <laughs> yeah. um, and these are things that, you know, we have it. We haven't quite specifically uh, experienced as engineers so far. Right. Know. So. So yes, the our uh, so we are, we're on the uh, east operations area of the PDK Airport in Atlanta, and um, that area doesn't have any utilities. So we're off the grid, but not necessarily in the good way when you think of <laughs> off the grid. Um, but going back to the seed round, all we had was two containers and our will to survive as a company, uh, which no indoor plumbing, <laughs> uh, no heating, no air, no nothing. Um, and the, one of the most special things that you can have in a test site is indoor plumbing. I just can't tell you enough how excited (laughs) I am that we have four indoor, uh, you know, restrooms at our test site. It was such a big moment for us. (laughs) And a good HVAC system. So we actually have a chance to cool down in the the hot summers. I know. It's, it's, uh, you guys have no idea how good you have it. Well, <laughs> wait till we're in the desert trying to fly. Yeah, that's, that's true. We're all going to suffer. That's but true. But for the good reasons. Absolutely. But yeah, no, be, beyond that, there's just a lot, a lot of, um, you know, systems you have to develop. You know, I'm a test stand monkey myself through my career. Um, you know, you're talking about all the fuel, you know, propellant supply systems, um, all the, you know, ones and zeros that you need to develop to make things, um, you know, work the right way. It's an incredible amount of work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, so we've we put a lot of work out there uh, building, you know, 
fuel supply systems and uh, just, you know, other systems to supply cooling to some of our instrumentation and uh, just general like electronics. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work out there just running wires and uh, <laughs> just a lot of plumbing and electrical has been a lot of my responsibility out there. So it's been kind of fun to learn this diverse skill set, uh, managing contractors, uh, bringing people in every single day, escorting contractors across the airfield just to fill up diesel tanks and water tanks, <laughs> <laughs> just driving 15 miles an hour down that road um, is, is a lot of what it takes. So it's just a lot of the kind of the nitty gritty, like not glamorous work that it takes to keep the test site running. Yeah. Um, but I think that also just, just kind of makes it a lot of fun because it's all the things, all the stories you get to tell uh, just out there sweating in the heat. Oh, I've got a great <laughs> story from the seed round talking about uh, sweating from the heat. <laughs> Early days, um, it, again, no air conditioning. It was hot, hot, hot. Uh, middle of August uh, in Atlanta, hot Atlanta. And um, no air conditioning, so I was, you know, installing a bunch of, um, you know, tubing and whatnot for some of the fuel supply systems, and uh, I was sweating too much, so I just took my <laughs> shirt off and started working uh, without my shirt on. And uh, here comes the airport director with his entourage that I wasn't expecting at the time. So I ended up shaking a bunch of hands with, you know, guys in suits uh, without a shirt on. <laughs> I was like, I apologize for the bare, you know, the bare chestedness, but uh, hi, I'm the CTO <laughs> here at Hermes. Uh, but yeah, definitely not there anymore. That's that's a that's a that's a fun thing. But um, it is hard. It is hard uh, developing um, your own propulsion systems. Um, you know, nothing's necessarily predictable. Be it you know the external uh, dependencies we have with suppliers or how you know combustion instability or or whatever other factors um, you know kind of um, put you on a different path or a different arc. Uh, but I do think it's one that's important that we develop our own propulsion systems because if you look at, you know, uh, like, let's say, making a clean sheet engine design that can go Mach 3, it's a ton of challenges there, right? Or even even one that can go, uh, you know, Mach 2, that can operate at Mach 2 very efficiently is a very difficult problem that could be billions of dollars. Uh, and it's one thing that sets us apart from, you know, other supersonic startups there is that, you know, we, we're, we're taking an off-the-shelf engine, wrapping a high-speed flow path around it, and, you know, kind of skipping go a little bit, um, you know, leveraging what we have um, to uh, make something work now and, and take that, you know, the spinny part development out of our critical path, which is really the, you know, as much as I would like to say that afterburners are the hard part, it's not. It's the <laughs> spinny parts yeah. that, uh, that are really uh, will kill you in terms of development. Yep, that's one of the few that we like have not done per our like pillars of vertically integrating. Mm -hmm. um, of like, you look at everything else or most everything else at this company, it's a lot of in-house work from the test site to components to mm -hmm. engine hardware. Um, that's like one of the things that like we're we're pulling so much in-house because it's so important to control, um, uh, kind of like our our own destiny there, not be so reliant on uh, outside suppliers. Um, one of the things that like. You, you alluded to on the test site um but like was like so like meaningful to me like as being part of the company was like that test site like we got like the containers from a company but um so much of that test site was built out by the engineering team yeah. um and and also uh like the tech squad that we have um but like that was like built on like the backs of the employees yeah. and like our sweat and like tears and blood went into that. Yeah, literally, I bled on that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> still bleeding on yeah. it. <laughs> still bleeding on it. Yeah, but even, it was a minor cut. Just but even last year, it was everybody, not even the technical people, working to build up some of the capabilities. Yeah, to test yeah. Site. we had everybody like even putting rails on and making sure things were safe. And mm -hmm. and one of the things that gets me and uh, is. You know, if, if you've ever met Glenn, you, you know he has an eye for an aesthetic of how things <laughs> should look. It's an understatement. <laughs> well, my wife calls me Diva G. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, if you ever come to the site, you'll see that we have basically a sub-basement of like three feet where a lot of important lines and harnesses are routed underneath. And I try to go down there periodically, but I'm I'm really starting to show my age. Like, <laughs> my back just can't handle it. But we we've had some wonderful interns that just want to spend all day working under there. Mm. So I'm like, have at it, have fun. There's important work to be done down there. I can come down and take a look when you're done, but I can't 
Oh, I yeah. can't physically move around as easily Maybe. on there as and I wish a, I could. That's a great <laughs> point you make about the interns. Is I think we're one of the few organizations out there that really treat treat interns like full time employees. Uh, there, I think we get that a lot of just wow. I had no idea they can actually work on an engine. That's pretty cool. And we get to the point where they're we're actually hurting when they leave for a little bit. Yes. Yeah. So like at the end of last year, our interns finished a week before we were done for the year and they started a week after we started. So we had two weeks with no interns and it felt like, like the, propul- the, companies the, lost. the propulsion team <laughs> just like got halved. Like we all of a sudden were like, Oh, intern can do this or full-time person can do this. It's like, Nope, it's all full-time. We just got to execute right. and get it done. And, right. but then we had a, a huge influx of people the second week of January. So we've made up for that for sure. Right. So uh, jumping into a little bit about the architecture uh, of the engine, I wanted to hit on that a little bit before we talk about some of the testing we're going to do in the future. Um, I guess, you know, Eric walked us through a little bit uh, about the general um, components there. Uh, One of the more unique things that we have uh, is the fact that we have to, you know, operate uh, this hot air and and basically divert it away and around uh, the engine. Uh, And the the original architect of that bypass system is, yeah. The man sitting right here. <laughs> no, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about the ins and outs, the uh, you know, forward bypass doors, aft bypass doors, how's those, how those work, and and how we're going to make that engine survive. Yeah. So, um, like, it's a challenge because we're moving a lot of air around the engine at really high temperatures. Um, we also needed to like heavily optimize the flow path um, mm-hmm. because pressure drops are so important in a propulsion system. Right. Um, so it was actually different than I. Uh, approached a lot of the problems at SpaceX where pretty much like I had to start with a flow path and and optimize that flow path and then build the geometry around it um, for for what the things had to do but then also right. consider architectures of like how do we actually change the state if it's active passive um, what's going on when um, and then obviously at high temperatures like sealing is is a, a, a primary concern <laughs> because a lot of the soft goods that you use at lower temperatures right. Um, you actually can't use uh, at, at our Mach 5 stagnation temperatures. Yeah, it's no such thing as a hot seal. That's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just a less leaky one. Yeah. So we, you know, we've we've come up with a lot of creative solutions for for getting around the ceiling ceiling issues. Um, trying to really drive towards the simplest solution that we can that that achieves what we need to do, and really leveraging uh, a lot of the architecture of the plane itself to to be able to do these things. Um, it's it's like it's a definitely an overconstrained problem of uh you're working with uh um not ballooning the oml of the vehicle out too much like the outer mold line of the vehicle um Mm -hmm. by making these things so big um but also uh trying to reduce your pressure losses um optimizing for mass um uh optimizing for simplicity uh definitely a fun fun challenge um that i think we're in a good spot um and uh and we're we're testing it um uh, over the next uh, next little bit here, yeah, that's uh, which is probably a good segue into the next uh, topic of what is ne- next in our, uh, our our testing cadence, right? So we're right in the throes of um, you know testing here at sea level static conditions. Of course, we're using the J D five to pull in you know uh, ambient air to uh, run the you know ram burner in afterburner mode, um, uh, which. Uh, Alex, I don't know if you want to. You'll be able to talk a little bit about the uh, the intricacies there uh, when we get to the the, the high speed testing. But uh, the problem, though, is that at our sea level static test facility, we can't really simulate those high temperature, high enthalpy uh, inlet conditions that um, you know we'll see in flight. And so that's one of the reasons why we're going up to Notre Dame. So Notre Dame, um, I, I don't know, Eric, you want to talk a little bit about some of the Notre Dame capabilities and why we're going there? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, um, well before I started here, uh, Glenn and team were cultivating the relationship with Notre Dame so that we could use and build up a direct connect facility so that we could get high enthalpy subsonic airflows going into our engine because they'll allow us to get above Mach 3 conditions. Um, so we're, we're going to be simulating flight-like conditions as best that we can on the ground in a reasonable amount of time. The the United States has some really great test facilities um, where you can go even well above Notre Dame's capabilities, but unfortunately for us, uh, 
they're booked out years, yeah. one, two, three years in advance. And, and rightfully so, right? Yeah. I mean, we're in a period of time where that geopolitical uh, influence of hypersonics is pretty high. And in a lot of those, um, well, you know, our, our aircraft are kind of like, okay, well, point to point as well as ISR platforms, uh, the, uh, you know, I guess importance of what they should be testing are, are, are the missiles and the and the, the weapons that they're doing. Um, th- those certainly take precedence over what we're doing, but it's uh, it's very difficult to get in. Yeah. So that's where building up this relationship and this capability with Notre Dame is going to be great for us. Mm-hmm. And the, the critical thing that we're going to be exercising on the ground very frequently is the fact that we transition from turbojet to ramjet mode. Right. If we weren't able to demonstrate that on the ground, I think we'd be a lot more scared about trying to, to fly quarter horse. Right. But that buys down a significant amount of risk and it just it's more just takes us time if we have to go back and forth between uh, Atlanta and Notre Dame, but right. at least that's easier than continuing to crash into the desert because we miss something on yeah. the ground. And, th- and that's like a 50 to $100 million facility that we're using, right? So that kind of reduces our our bottom line there a little bit so we don't have that kind of liability in terms of capital. Uh, but I guess walk me through what uh, that particular facility does, right? Um, I guess walk our listeners through. So uh, it's simulating air that's coming downstream of the inlet, right? So it's already already shocked down to subsonic speeds. And then uh, we uh, part of the, the whole experiment there uh, is to show that our pre-cooler works, right? And our pre-cooler is the thing that we don't talk about. <laughs> yeah, I thought you weren't <laughs> going to talk about it. Yeah, we're not going to talk about the pre-cooler. But uh, no, it's not, uh, you know, there's, there's some really interesting ways to do pre-cooling uh, and uh, to satisfy some of our friends out there. It's not uh, anything near uh, what Reaction Engines does. They're doing some pretty cool stuff, but unfortunately, the you know Delta P's and things like that are king. And also, just the ability to pick up enough heat from your fuel is is kind of limiting there when you're talking about um, you can pick up any heat to your fuel uh, when you're talking about those types of things. So uh, we use a different type. We're not going to talk about it because it's secret. <laughs> but um, but after it's cooled, so we use that to match corrected flow rates into the engine, right? And um, so that's very important for turbojets. Those corrected flow rates go, uh, and it really, what that is is um, a match between the pressure and temperature that the the incoming air is. And uh, jet engines typically like a you know constant corrected um, flow rate into the engine. So we use that pre cooler to do that up to our transition, which Eric talked about uh, transitioning from turbojet to um, to ramjet and that's where things get tricky right is like how do we shut down the engine uh at the right you know sequencing and also bypass air around while theoretically trying to keep the uh ram burner lit (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's one of the tough parts uh you know i have my flow path uh, at the inlet moving around on me yeah i've got temperatures changing drastically i've got pressures changing drastically and a lot of them are kind of going in the wrong direction. That's, yes. <laughs> it's not convenient for combustion. No. Um, so that's that's been pretty fun. I was actually going to jump in and, and talk about this too earlier when we are talking about designing the bypass system. So Noah's kind of designing the flow path for this thing. We're going back and forth, and he already realizes how over-constrained the problem is. And he's showing me a flow path. He's like, I think I finally got it. I think I finally got one that works in both modes. And I look at it, and I'm just like, yeah, but that's you're gonna catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the drawing board. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that was pretty fun. But uh, but honestly, we we kept iterating and kept iterating, and we finally got to something that I, that I think is gonna work in both modes. Um, yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll get up there. We'll we'll demonstrate transition. You know, Alex is gonna be looking a lot of um, you know combustion um, efficiencies and stability, especially at those low Mach number ranges. Um, that's a lot of incredibly important data. Um, but beyond that, it's um, you know we're not going to necessarily Mach five at, at at Notre Dame. They can't they can't handle those enthalpies. So there's a lot of learning that we're still going to have to push on the uh, flight testing. Which um, you know once we're up at that Mach three and a half to four range, it really becomes a thermal management problem. Yeah, not so much of a combustion problem actually, which is nice right. because. Um, that's actually one of the conditions that I'm least worried about as a combustion <laughs> engineer because everything is nice and hot yes, <laughs> and high pressure. And uh, that's great for combustion. So if it works well at those lower Mach number conditions, um, it might work too well at Mach 5. Right, right. Well, that's <laughs> so it's a thermal management but, so problem. So Alex, yeah. what scares you the most about the Ram burner? What scares me the most? <laughs> uh, what scares me the most is that um, at some condition, when we first reach that condition, 
in testing, uh, that something just blows up. Um, because <laughs> some version of that usually happens in, in every test campaign. Um, so I think we have some good mitigations in place for that. Um, but you know, there's always the, there's always the daunting problem of combustion instability. Um, people always say, um, we don't know where it's going to be, but we always know that it is going to be there. Um, so the, you know, that's kind of where for, uh, for our listeners, that's where kind of the flame, uh, feeds back. And this is, this is going to be so jargony anyway. Oh, but go for <laughs> it. I love it. I'm following. Let's yeah, go. <laughs> this is where this is where the heat release from combustion is feeding back into the acoustic modes. And basically, right. it just gets really, really loud inside the combustor. And it can actually get so loud that it can blow out the flame. Um, or, you know, it can increase heat transfer rates to your components and cause things to get uh, a lot hotter than you would otherwise predict and cause things to burn up. Um, and these are present at some condition in every single afterburner design. Right. Um, so yeah, you can't predict it. All you can do is test it. Uh, but that's that's the fun part, right? So it's kind of it's kind of convenient if you like making fire. Well, yes, we certainly all <laughs> love making fire. Uh, it, it, but that's one of the bigger challenges there, right? Once we get once we get above, you know, the Mach four range, it, it becomes a big thermal management problem, and that's one of the things that you know rockets don't really have. They burn at about the same same temperature, right? Uh, the rocket engines are very high power. High density devices, right? They operate at thousand or so psi. You know, we operate in tens of psi, right? So it doesn't seem like it's as big of a uh, high pressure, but um, it w- we end up being because of that lower pressure, we end up being a bigger system, right? So you know, um, afterburners, ram burners, and the like end up being larger volumetric devices, which then has a negative effect of if you want to pick up heat from something like fuel to get get fuel to pick up the heat from the exterior part of the vehicle or the exterior part of the engine, you have so much surface area. Uh, it's the same reason why expanders don't work above, you know, 50,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, exa- it's because you just don't have enough fuel to pick up the surface heat uh, on, the, on the engine, right? Um, and that makes it extremely challenging. Not only that, it's like our oxidizer flow rate is changing almost continuously. <laughs> and it's uh, just based on your flight condition, you're either at a lower flow rate, you're at a lower pressures, and you have to, you know, uh, qualify this engine in a, such a wide range of operating conditions. It's, um, you know, it, it's all, almost daunting compared to rocket engine testing. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of goes back, like, one of the ways that we address that, again, is thinking about how can we make this passive. So uh, it's like, how can we have a fixed geometry, if possible, or just a, a passively actuated uh, geometry, right, that moves the flow around where you want it to go in right. order to keep things cool but you also you know this is always you're always thinking about your cycle to your thermodynamic cycle so any fluid that you're using for cooling or anything you're dumping heat into you have some penalty to your thermodynamic cycle so that's you right. want to get it just right at every single condition that's right and not <laughs> only that there's a lot of uh you know thermodynamic cooling that we need to do on the rest of the vehicle as well right because there's a there's some things that are getting hot that can't get hot, avionics, things like that, that we want to devote some of that cooling capacity to, which, you know, the engine has to share. So it's a incredibly couple problem, very difficult problem. Um, if you're bored with rockets, come work for Hermius. <laughs> uh, there's the pitch. <laughs> yeah, there's the pitch for you. <laughs> All those really good thermal engineers come yeah, on by. Yeah, those right. <laughs> we need some. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but, but yeah, after we, uh, av- after we show that... Uh, y- you know, test data at uh, at Notre Dame. Um, the next step, really, you know, is of course qual acceptance testing of the engine of our, our block one. So our block zero is kind of a little mix. What you see on the the uh, the internet is our block zero engine. It's a little bit of a mix of um, some flightish weight components mixed with some very heavy weight stout components, just to lower cost. And, you know, hurry up development time so you don't have to do all the iteration cycles to get it down to flight weight. Uh, but block one is, uh, you know, basically our first flight engine uh, for that. It's it's flight weight, um, maybe some limitations here or there in temperature, uh, and then block two will get us up to that Mach five condition. Uh, but beyond that, we're not we're not we're not going to test this thing in a full scale inlet to you know um, tip to tail test in a free jet fashion. So for our listeners, uh, direct connect what we're doing at at Notre Dame is. Subsonic air coming in at the right enthalpies. Um, and traditionally, you would have an, um, an inlet 
uh, married to the engine, and you'd put it in a free jet with approximately 10x the flow rate that the engine's actually seeing, so you don't choke the the uh, test facility and whatnot. And those facilities, <laughs> we were talking about them before at uh, like AADC or whatnot. Those are you know we're waiting, going to wait two or three years to get into them, and they might be 10 to 20 million dollars per entry. Uh, and for that kind of uh, dollars, we could build several quarter horses, and we can lawn dart one or two. So uh, that's kind of our, you know, build, test, uh, make holes in the desert, and repeat strategy. Uh, but that that's that's how we're going to get there. Um, but uh, that that's one of the things that really uh, is different for us is that we're tolerant on, you know, learning through. Uh, failure essentially compared to a lot of aerospace companies out there much more akin to the space world and rocket development and you know um, rocket engine development world than than per se the the aircraft development and i think that's good for for the aerospace in general yeah i'm always a big fan of trying to do analysis to get the 85 90 percent right. solution so you have confidence when you're going in to build it but you don't spend the next 10, so you don't do 20 the analysis years to get paralysis. this yeah, 99% confidence, and then it's too expensive to fail. Right. Whereas if you can do like a six-month or one-year iteration cycle, and then right. we put it on a vehicle and fly it, we'll learn so much more and get ready for subsequent vehicles. Yeah, and that's like another one of the nice things, like parallels between aviation and, and the rocket world, is um, that uh, like when – you let a rocket go and there's an anomaly, like there's no taking that back <laughs> yeah. um, with us. Like Cross your fingers and hope. Right. We can have a little bit better risk posture there where um, uh, we take off. If there's an anomaly that's non-critical, we just come back to base, uh, resolve it on the ground and uh, and go from there. It it's, really simplifies the Famica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of when you have that, uh, you know, oh, we lose X, Y, or Z and we can return to base, uh, mm -hmm. unpowered landing. That's yep. uh it's a massive win of just not having to spend as much time on, um, you know, triple redundant systems and the like. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the envelope expansion. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think one of the other interesting things kind of on that note, too, that, you know, I get the question a lot. Like, why is now the time mm -hmm. that we can develop this Mach 5 airplane? Right. Right. What is this kind of like convergence of technology that's, that, point. Yeah. that's allowed us to do this? And I think like something that shouldn't be missed is we're kind of just to the point where uh, we can take these risks with hardware because we don't have to have a human on board. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, now with, with autonomous technology and remote remote piloted capabilities, we don't have to worry about making this thing safe for a human. Right. So not only is that a safety issue, but it's also in development, we don't have to develop all the systems on the initial vehicle that support a human. Yeah, so, could you imagine of having to develop a supersonic aircraft with a human on board? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> first flight <laughs> oops <laughs> uh, never mind the ejection part of that which is uh, is an interesting maneuver yeah um but but yeah no I, that's a that's a very valid point of um being able to take risk with autonomous vehicles and that it's not only that that's that's kind of in our, our what we want to see eventually too right we uh one day i don't want pilots on board you know i want a pilot off board, you know, just hey, hey guys, just check it in on your flight here, on your short ninety minute flight. Uh, just everything's going great. Uh, we're here to support you if you need it. You don't really need pilots anymore. Most aircraft fly themselves and take off and landing. Shh, um, pilots yeah. don't like to hear that. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh -oh. I mean, it's yeah, the, I know they don't <laughs> like to hear it, but the fact is, is it's uh, you know, uh, there's there's more anomalies that happen in flight because of human error than there are because of computer error. Barring the 737 Max issue, but that's that's another that's another one. Um, yeah, I won't yeah. mention that one. And that's something that's something too that um, it's it's definitely taking a minute for uh, the general public to realize that because that's mm -hmm. another question I get too. They're like, "Well, is it going to have a pilot on board?" And I said, "I don't know. I don't know that we need a pilot on board." They're like, "Well, I would never get on that plane if there's no pilot on yeah. board." <laughs> well, regulatorily speaking, uh, we're we are uh, required to have two pilots on board across. Uh, oceans right now, but I think that re uh, regulation is going to change by the time um, you know the transports in the air and, and flying people. And I hope that quarter horse and, and then soon to be dark horse will be uh, also um, you know the things that pave the way of showing. Look how many flight hours that we have under our belt 
uh, with whatever safety record associated with it. This is clearly meeting and exceeding the bar for transoceanic flight without pilots. But with that being said, um, I think we have uh, some uh, questions from the listeners. Oh, that, yeah. That I want to bring in uh, because, you know, um, it's, uh, you know. I love the hard hat. Oh, I know. <laughs> so I'm going to pull questions out of a hard hat. Are they, are they <laughs> difficult questions? We'll see. I hope they are. I love difficult questions. Um, but so first one, uh, why do rocket engines have more thrust than turbine engines? I'll let you guys go and then I'll weigh in. <laughs> Well, it goes back to what you were saying before, just the volume we have. We have, with a rocket engine, you can have so much more energy density. Right. Uh, you just pump it down, and you can also build up your system to have, you know, a 1,000 PSI combustion right. chamber gas, or, or like even 4,000 PSI, depending on how you're structuring your, your turbine machinery upstream. Right. So just operating at those significantly higher pressures, uh, and since you're injecting your, most of the time, liquid oxidizer mm -hmm. into the system you're not as dependent on the the lower density air coming in right and the other thing i'd, I'd mention on that is that uh yes they have more thrust usually not always i mean the hadley is five thousand pounds of thrust you know jd5 is around five thousand pounds of thrust but jd5 is massive compared to yeah. the hadley uh but on the converse side of that Jet engines are way higher performing than rocket engines, right? So rocket engines, 350, you know, 420-ish seconds max. Uh, you know, jet engines can get into the 2,000 plus. You know, uh, you know, uh, even just looking at turbo uh, turbo jets, right, um, uh, can get into the 2,000 seconds or so. Um, so that's the that's the trade is performance versus pure unadulterated thrust. Now. Uh, quarter horse is one of those things where it would love to be a rocket, <laughs> right? Uh, it's an accelerator mission, right? It wants to be a rocket, but it's not part of our technological roadmap, right? We want to build a, a vehicle that, you know, touches Mach 5 and is reusable. Um, and, you know, and those accelerator missions, it wants to be a rocket. It wants to get up and out of the atmosphere and go. However, the military uh, are, you know, as an ISR platform um, and the, the general public my personal belief won't be riding rockets point to point. Uh, they just don't have the number of nines that's going to satisfy the industry in the decade, two decades that we want to fly these things, right? And on the military side for, you know, quarter horse and dark horse, you can't marshal planes uh, very well when you have a rocket system versus a, um, uh, a, turbo, a turbo fan where you can just sort of hang around in the atmosphere a little bit and then go. Um, and, and also, you have Jet A everywhere. You don't have liquid oxygen everywhere where you you base. So uh, that poses a serious um, a problem when you're talking about trying to use you know cryogens or fancy fuels um, in other places where you want to base or support operations out of. But cool. Let's see here. Next one. Any ceramics in the engine? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, we we would love to have some, right? Um, there's certainly some places I think that we can benefit uh, right now. Our, um, you know, kind of going in assumption is is that let let's stay away from ceramics as much as possible because the production capability of the United States isn't there in terms of large scale production. They're very expensive, long lead. Uh, but there are some places that we might be able to take advantage of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you're talking about specifically like ceramic matrix composites, right? Yeah. So this is a really cool technology that's, uh, you know, it's it's almost there um, where you can save probably like two thirds of your mass um, for a given, you know, temperature and pressure limit. Um, so using those to build some of the larger components that are essentially pressure vessels. So our high speed flow path, um, then, you know, the casing for the ram burner. Um, or especially the nozzle where, you know, your temperatures are kind of at a maximum um, in the engine. That would give us significant performance benefits. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of challenges with those uh, dealing with thermal expansion and how do you interface those with uh, metallics because we're not going to build the entire turbojet engine um, all the way up to the inlet 
out right. of CMCs. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> it would it, it literally be more expensive than gold by weight. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll definitely be pretty strategic in where we try and yeah. utilize it as we go through our trades. It's where you can that. minimize mass and increase performance, right? That's where the those those make a lot of sense. And and judging on the work that you know other companies like GE um, have done, it's usually going to be so. You know, they, they're moving into the rotating components part of that, uh, but for us, it'll it'll mostly be static, stationary uh, applications of those things. Um, next question: uh, Why ramjet instead of scramjet? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I think um, so. First of all, the difference between a ramjet and a scramjet: a ramjet um, is always operating; the internal flow path is always subsonic, um, but uh, well, downstream of the inlet. Um, <laughs> yes. So uh, scramjet actually never shocks all the way down to subsonic. Uh, scramjet just stands for supersonic combustion ramjet. So the combustion process actually takes place um, at supersonic velocities. Um, to the reason why you would use a scramjet is because uh, you actually have a lot more losses if you're flying really, really fast and you have to shock all the way down to subsonic. You're going to take a lot more losses. So those make sense for really, really high Mach numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the nice things about our operational range is that um, it still trades better. We still have better performance with a ramjet up to you know Mach 5, even Mach 6, I think a ramjet still makes sense. And that also right. makes the problem a lot easier for us. We don't have to deal with the flow path. You thought it was hard to design a flow path to uh, accommodate both you know the exhaust of the turbojet and then also the flow coming in from the bypass ducts. Um, talk about a flow path that has to also function at subsonic speeds coming out of the turbojet exhaust and then also supersonic speeds. Well, yeah, I mean, you essentially have two complete parallel flow paths, right? Because you won't want those, uh, you know, stubby flame holders or whatnot inside a... I mean, your flame holders look completely different. They look more like a backwards-facing step versus, you know, a V-gutter or something like that uh, in a, in a ram burner. Yeah, so it just kind of fundamentally changes... Um, all the physics that you care about for the combustion device. Right. Um, so, yeah, so it just, like, it still makes sense uh, from a performance perspective to operate the ramjet versus the scramjet up to the up to Mach Agreed. 5. Yeah. I agree. Let's see here. Uh, the SR-71 has variable inlet cones. Does Chimera have something similar? Uh, the answer is yes. I'm probably the closest out of the, the four of us to talk about inlet aerodynamics, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump on this first, and you guys... Uh, chime in but uh, yeah we do have variable uh, geometry there that acts very similar to the SR-71 uh, except we don't have this spike that's extending back and forth it's much more of a streamlined higher performing uh, inlet over the now it's not higher performing at SR-71's design point uh, but it is a higher performing over the range of uh, of Mach numbers and that's the kind of the, the thing that you learn with uh, you know, engines at these speeds that have to go through a wide range of Mach numbers is that you're not really making a good inlet or engine at any one condition. You're just making a not so crappy one <laughs> at all of them. Right. <laughs> as long as you can complete the mission profile, that's what we care about. Yeah, here. that's right. It's uh, as long as you can do the acceleration. Any any other comments on that one? No. No. Um, oh, I can't. Well. What is the maximum thrust? It's in the order of 5,000 <laughs> pounds of thrust. It's somewhere around there. Sea level static thrust. I mean, it really, you, it, you can come up with that number by looking at the airflow rate of a J85-21 and then burning all that air stoichiometrically, right? <laughs> so you can kind of come up with that. It's in the order of 5,000 pounds. <laughs> and that's the sea level, right? It drops off um, as you go higher, right? Um, physics says that, that. Um, you know, the, the as you go faster, you get some ram, um, ram drag associated with the, the gas turbine engine. And then once we switch over to, to ramjet mode, um, it's, um, you know, all about the ram drag as well as uh, taking that pressure and expanding it, uh, burning it and expanding it. So uh, of that of that order of magnitude. Let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, what resources or schooling do you recommend for people who want to get into propulsion? Well, I think we have some varying opinions on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got two PhDs on here <laughs> and two masters, right? So, well. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I would say, I'll at least say this. Uh, 
if you want to really get into combustion and do the really fun stuff, um, I think it's worth. I'll compromise a little here. I think it's worth at least starting on your PhD ah. <laughs> and doing some experimental work. I think we'll get a lot of value uh, out of that. Um, it's yeah, it's questionable whether spending the last four years just trying to rewrite the same paragraph over and over again and like fix the axes on that one figure <laughs> that really doesn't even matter and no one's going to look at. Right. I'm not sure if that's if that's actually worth it. Um, I did it. So I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> well, let's hear from the other PhD from Purdue. Yeah, so I, I actually I agree a lot with Alex. Um, I got my PhD primarily because at some point when I retire from all this fun industry work, I do want to teach. So having that that PhD on my behind me definitely helps with that objective. But really, getting that master's I think really helps to establish uh, a, a, the fundamentals that you need. That said, I actually think the way that the aerospace industry has grown in the last 20 years, people coming out of school with their undergrad degree uh, in general in general engineering, mechanical engineering, um, if you actually have a school that you could focus on propulsion, mm -hmm. that's great. And then jump into one of the startups, right? Oh, yeah. Like that's one of the, the hands-on learning, like um, to date myself or to date Glenn and I, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we just start. not yourself. Yeah. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, we both started with our grad school at Purdue in 2005. So everything that's blown up since in the last like 15 years in the launch industry was very much in its infancy then. So there weren't as many opportunities. So like mm -hmm. I went to Purdue because I wanted hands-on propulsion experience. That's right. And the lab there allowed us that that possibility oh it still does this yeah. is a plug for purdue <laughs> uh, yeah sorry sorry georgia tech. <laughs> <laughs> as much as i love georgia tech too because we get a lot of great candidates from there uh boiler up yeah <laughs> um but yeah and i'll also say one of the things that i, I i've seen as a um a directorate or i guess a, a direction from the government is uh i'm a part of the um uh, university consortium of applied hypersonics um, I support that, and it's a it's a great uh, initiative. They're trying to figure out how do we how do we get you know more people involved in hypersonics. How do we get people uh, students there? And and they did some studies, and it really looks like most of the companies out there are looking for that master's level student. Um, there are some you know some PhD work that, uh, but g just getting your bachelor's degree is probably not meeting the bar as far as even outside of just Hermius. I mean, yes, it meets the bar. It depends on who you are, right? Uh, but um, uh, but for most companies in general, getting a master's is what you should do in in terms of you know uh, pursuing uh, advanced degrees. But but outside of that, sign up for that UCA, um, uh you know uh, University of, um, Consortium uh, of Applied Hypersonics because that's such a uh, they they do take uh, you have to apply and you have to be a U.S. citizen. It's a, a clearinghouse, right? But uh, it, it's a good way to get introduced into the the world of hypersonics if you're if you're interested in that yeah, yeah i do have one thing to add though for people who don't like say their undergrad doesn't have aerospace or something related to say rocket or air breathing propulsion uh if you if your school has formula sae like yes. definitely get in involved or something similar to that really just doing a lot of that hands-on work you can leverage that in your first job or even yeah. leverage that to get into a <laughs> master's program for propulsion because you've already had some of that experience beyond what you would learn just in the classroom. Yeah, yeah I've, for, for, for young folks, I look at uh, their resume, and as they've said, they've bent tubes or flared tubes. Yeah, yeah. I want to hire them. So. Yeah. No, yeah, you've been trying to say something. There's so many, <laughs> like, good parallels that we, like, pull a lot of times from Formula SAE, like somebody who's designed an air intake for a car. Like, right. there's a lot of similarities between a car air intake and, like, um, like how air travels in a plane. Um, right. So like there's there's so much like parallel uh, like tech and, and knowledge that you can use there. Um, but yeah, for, for undergrad, um, like definitely like things that you can like do to go and uh, like better yourself for propulsion or for, for combustion or definitely any, any of those hands-on like project teams. Right. Um, doesn't need to be Formula SA. Like Formula SA is a great one. Um, but Georgia Tech has a rocket team that. Um, oh, YJSP. Yep, yeah, I'll YJSP. Give them a, yeah. a, a shout out <laughs> there right. too. That's we also help. Uh, well, try to support them as much as we can. Uh, they they're out at PDK with us and we give them a spot to test. But uh, and also it's a two way street there because we get some great engineers uh, and get uh, we've hired a couple of them. So 
or at least intern and hired one. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really anything that gets you out there, putting your actually building hardware, testing it um, that you designed yourself and then seeing how it breaks and learning that lesson. Yeah. Anything Tell that allows you to do that. Tell time you blew something up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Um, what has been the hardest part about developing this engine? <laughs> what hasn't been the hardest part? <laughs> It's like it seems like every every uh, week I'm like, how do we get the mass down? <laughs> how do we get the mass down? Right. Yeah. And at, at like the high level, it is like I was saying earlier, an, an over constrained problem where like there are so many different facets that you need to focus on at the same time. Um, and you know, we're we're 50 people right now. We're growing, but we like don't spend like an engineer on like everything that probably needs a dedicated engineer right now. <laughs> yeah. Um so like that's that's one of the things that like to optimize this this thing like we can't rely on like analysis alone like we ne- need to go and do a lot of testing and, and physical like hardware implementation to to get it right. Right. Um but yeah it's just trying to trying to burn down the optimization without spending so many hours on it. Yeah. And we're also still in the process of building the company that builds the airplane or builds the engine. So some of us might have been used to, oh, I've got this facility ready to go to do this test I want to do. But instead, now it's like, how do I come up with a scrappy solution to still learn what I need to learn? Um, and this actually goes back to what we were saying earlier. That's where it's a great opportunity for interns and new grads to basically own something completely. It's like, we don't have the capability right now to test X. So go figure out how to test it. Oh, First, identify that you need to test it. And then figure out how to actually test it in a safe and efficient manner. Yeah, you know so you're talking up to, that capability. You know you're talking to a bunch of propulsion engineers when you're, you know, it, it's one of those things where everybody is talking about the hard part is the testing. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've lived it. I mean, it just uh, with Alex, uh, you know, he's a combustion guy, right? Doing all the combustion work. But he's the same guy that has to go out there and figure out how to ER5000 works and, and how to make that work when it's not, has any, it doesn't have anything to do with you know combustion but it's like how do i get the right pressure at my system yeah but i knew how to do that before because yeah. <laughs> i've been doing this a lot and yeah. the number of er3000s and er5000s that are right. trouble shot it's crazy but why is it this working <laughs> uh okay well, i'll figure it i can't i'm not gonna wait to get avionics help i'm just gonna dive in and do this myself and i think that's one of the more appealing things here is that you're encouraged to just bias to action and that was a, that was a funny kind of pathetic looking event too because i'm standing outside <laughs> and like the weather is has kind of turned pretty bad and it's like pouring rain it eventually stops raining and i get the thing working i get it pressurized but then it's the first time we've tested leak tested the system so it's actually just <laughs> pissing yeah. jet fuel all over me <laughs> and i was going Luckily out to dinner a few feet away from there yeah. <laughs> yeah i was like going out to dinner with my friends later and I, i'm like, just like oh you're wearing eau de jeté <laughs> I'm standing out here holding this little handheld potentiometer that yeah. has like wire nuts on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. And then you got, and then that's you got what it's be, all about. And you gotta be careful at the test site on those types of days when the door just goes flying open <laughs> with the, the high gusts from the airport. <laughs> yeah, there's no trees to block the wind out yeah. there on the airfield. So it's like forget those door closers that yeah. uh, that they install on these doors. They don't work at all. The door will just whip right open and rip itself off the hinges <laughs> if you're not careful. That's right, that's right. Will uh, Chimera go on all vehicles or just quarter horse? Just quarter horse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, w- th- I mean, there, there's a few. There's a few things we're we're tracking there. Um, there, uh, there are some some interest, you know, outside of um, just Hermes of of what Chimera can do. Uh, but beyond that, um, it's really limited. Uh, and I'll open the floor up here a little bit to talk about it. But it's really limited in the what. Um, the J85 can do, right? The J85, uh, we, we picked that engine because it's something that is available. Uh, it has the right thrust class to build the smallest vehicle you can make to touch Mach 5 and be reusable. Uh, but beyond that, it's a pretty old technology engine, right? The overall compressor ratio is relatively low, you know, about three times, you know, one third that of modern engines. Uh, so it really struggles around that Mach 1 to 2 range. And we burn a lot of fuel, you know, punching through that. Um, so uh, I expect that when we move to Dark Horse, which will be something more of, you know, you, you would talk about more of the um, 
first class of modern military engines, uh, maybe not the F-35 kind of range, but, you know, you're more F-16, F-15, F-18 kind of range. Um, but that, that'll have those modern compressor ratios that'll, that'll help a good bit with that uh, accelerator performance. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, another comment, too. Um, one of the big challenges when we're thinking about what's so hard about designing this engine, um, when you start talking about hypersonics, the, basically the faster you fly, the rule of thumb is the more tightly integrated things are, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just the thrust class of the engine, but it's also like this isn't just an engine for a vehicle. It's an engine for a vehicle for a mission, right? So, right. Um, so it really only kind of makes sense for for this type of vehicle for this type of mission. So that's right. Yeah, but and, and we and we looked at putting multiple you know chimeras together early on to see if we can get up to a, a bigger vehicle. But it's just that that thrust flux, if you would, of the compressor ratio really just hurts you and it really doesn't scale well that way. Um, so you really have to go up in technology class to really increase the. Um, the the usable size vehicle that you could you could you could develop. Let's see here. How many more do we have? Oh, we gotta we should burn through these. Uh, can parts be three D printed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, basically, we're taking the approach that do a you know a trade against traditional traditional manufacturing and in and out of manufacturing what works what could work best for us. We are building up that capability in-house. Glenn can probably speak to it a, a, a little bit more. Um, but yeah, we, we're certainly keeping our, our eyes open on opportunities. We do have some interesting geometries that lend themselves very well to, to AM, but we're also very cognizant of the, the pain that potentially comes along with, <laughs> with AM development and material qualification for sure. But we at least get to, we'll have some fun building up that capability. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that we're um, like definitely taking a look at is uh, some of the large format um, additive. Uh, and I don't know, now, can we talk about like what we're doing in house? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, maybe go. you want to talk about it more. Um, but uh, we've got uh, robot arm um, printing large format uh, in house. Eat um, your heart out, relativity. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really nice for a lot of things. Um, if we're trying to print um, pieces of the airframe with it, um, but also uh, parts of the prop system, um, large engine components, right? Uh, even smaller engine components. Um, I mean, you had one component, uh, the uh, the AF bypass duct ring or the the, the, the yeah, big the ring yeah. that was uh, you know started out as a big piece of uh, Inconel plate. Yep. And by the time we're done with that part, it was a hundred thousand dollar part. Yeah, it was a hundred thousand dollar part, and I think we took ninety five percent of the mass out of <laughs> probably more than that, <laughs> right. actually. But and it started out <laughs> as like a thirty thousand dollar plate or something right. like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely not like the optimal way to, to manufacture that. Right. But like, right. Uh, you know, for for but what this we helps had to do with it a lot. Yeah. 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 So, um, moving forward, we're you know obviously exploring uh, large format for things like that. Yeah, but, I love but it. But on the flip side, though, from doing the the traditional versus am trade um on some of the ducks on chimera we we actually and we looked into dlms and it was going to be something like 40 different parts that we're going to have to hold together <laughs> right, and yeah. weld whereas it's like hmm. we found a really good shop that could form our the i think it's like quarter inch right ink and L plate and weld it up nicely and actually have enough space where they could do the the facing the final machining as a final welded assembly so it actually made sense right to go back to the tr tried and true essentially sheet metal parts. i mean at the end of the day we're a startup right and our job is to how do we get to meet the mission that we're given on budget and that doesn't mean necessarily doing all the the fanciest technology that you can Yes, we need, you know, and as a CTO, that's my part of my job is to, to where should we invest in technology where it can have, you know, a high, you know, we can leverage those technologies to, to uh, either reduce costs or speed ourselves up. Usually it's to speed ourselves up. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we have to make cost conscious decisions that move us forward. And, you know, traditional manufacturing is certainly something that we, we can. But we're bringing that in-house. We bring large format in house, uh, DMLS in house as well. Um, it's it's going to be a pretty pretty amazing um, uh, vertical integration story that we have here. Let's see, 
Uh, what's the jankiest <laughs> part of the engine? <laughs> I, oh man, I, man, I like whoever uh, whoever <laughs> sent that one in. I like that one a lot. Uh, the jankiest part. Oh man, uh, that seems like a Noah answer right there. You gotta, you gotta. There's something. Early days. Oof. I feel like I want to make some enemies. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not ready to answer this yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll give you cover. Can, can we just say no comment? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or are you going to force me to do it? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the jankiest right. part that I remember. So, uh, actually, it was not actually part of the engine. It was the actuator for the engine uh, to control throttle. Oh, yeah. That, so, we <laughs> had these micro uh, micromotion uh, um, uh, actuators, electromechanical actuators, uh, and that from the seed round that controlled the nozzle. You can see them in all of our uh, videos from the seed round. And... We needed an actuator on shorthand, and we couldn't get the one we wanted or whatnot. So we were like, hey, well, we got these actuators laying around. Let's just use these. And the thing, it was just when the engine heats up, you know, the engine moves a little bit. The actuator gets a little warmer, moves it, and that, that kind of, like, goes to a different throttle setting a little bit. And there's a lot of uh, – so that was our first take on it. We have a much better system now, <laughs> much better system. But uh, that, was, that was probably the most janky system. But beyond that, in the quarter horse unveil video what a lot of people don't realize is the problem that we had with the afterburner uh because the um the t5 amp is the devil incarnate you know it, it like the, the incarnate you know it's just the worst thing ever uh the the t5 amp uh sometimes it wants to work sometimes it doesn't want to work uh so we had some kind of problem with the t5 amp we also had a problem uh, probably somewhere in the um, afterburner fuel control, and it didn't want to work. So we found <laughs> through test that we could actually manipulate the T5 motor by loosening it just a little <laughs> bit and actually physically turning the motor. And that T5 motor actually opens up the stock JD5 nozzle a little bit. So uh, we we knew we needed to put on a good sh you know a good uh, performance, I guess you would, for that that unveil of just getting the full afterburner. But the engine wouldn't do it on its own control. So we strapped another uh, micro motion <laughs> controller on that T5 motor and had a different control. So one person, uh, you know, uh, Lisa was up there uh, controlling the throttle uh, at the control. And then we, I think we had Anthony on another throttle that controlled the nozzle position. Because <laughs> the thing was is that we could get it lit at small nozzle, but we needed to open up the nozzle as we went to max AB. So we had two people walking it up together which is probably the most janky thing i've ever seen but it worked nobody knew the difference until now <laughs> yeah now that's, the cat's out of the bag yeah, the secret's out <laughs> yeah. yeah and luckily but also, that's not part of the design <laughs> oh it's not part of the design but i am also incredibly proud of the team to, to actually execute on that in such a short amount of time because we were just faced with a bunch of problems in a incredibly compressed timeline and oh man it's that was a proud hermius moment <laughs> yeah. i i will say now that i've thought about it I'll choose one of my jankiest things on the engine so there that I don't make any enemies. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, we were moving fast uh, in the part design um, and didn't thoroughly think through the order of operations uh, on one of the pieces, um, uh, particularly a, a duct that's mating up to the J85 um, face. Um, so the, the, the fit up um, was a little bit challenging. Mm. Um, so as uh, uh like we, we put it up to start and uh holes weren't lining up um tried to get it in place with some clamps maybe like massage it into place um you know you can like squeeze it this way but then it ovalizes that way or that way or that way <laughs> yeah um, so it's like chasing the oval around the circle like trying to get the <laughs> bolt pattern to like line up um eventually got some clamps on it with a car jack on the inside pulling it out <laughs> um to like get it nice and circular <laughs> this is like three of us at like probably 10 p.m., like, just, like, trying to get this thing on there. I'm pretty sure you guys sent out a picture with beers in hand afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely a lot of beers. We got it on, um, but it was, uh, it it should have been, like, a 30-minute job, and it turned into, like, a five-hour job, but oh. we got it. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, there's, um, there's actually a lot of stories like that. I want to tell another one I'll and go throw myself it. under the bus, too. There's some other things that didn't quite fit up uh, well enough in the Ram Burner, so long story short, it results in me 
uh, putting the Ramburger in a cardboard box in the back of my Forerunner <laughs> and driving it up to Backwoods, Georgia on a Saturday. Uh, oh, with Brit? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Give, our friend Brit. Shout out. <laughs> oh, man. Our friend Brit Lynn. Oh, man, he is the best, best welder in maybe, maybe the United States, in my opinion, uh, but certainly in the Southeast. Yeah, so we drive it up there. We have the Ram Burner in Britt's shop, and he's got all these motorcycles up there. And there's just like some motorcycles sitting on the table uh, next to the Ram Burner. And <laughs> I also like, like playing. It up. I also like playing the game at Britt's shop of how many guns are in the shop because <laughs> there's so many that are just spread out in different parts, pieces, and everything. It's a fun game. You should try. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a really good time. So yeah. Um, how did you choose the name Chimera? Hmm. Uh, so we were brainstorming a few different names, um, one day and, uh, Jordan, um, originally came up with it and, uh, uh I, th- I think it is a very fitting name for, oh, yeah. for our engine. Like it's a hybrid fire breathing creature. Um, that is like definitely what our engine, like a description <laughs> of our engine. <laughs> like it's this definitely hi- a like hybrid that has two different modes yeah. and it better breathe fire. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing our job right if we don't. Um, what type of facility is used for testing? So we, I think we covered this a little bit, but we'll just hit it real quick. Yeah, just uh, a couple of fun facts about the test facility. So uh, if you followed us online at all, you've probably seen uh, that our first test facility is actually right behind us is yeah. in a single shipping container that was just sitting on a grass field. That's right. Uh, but we have a little bit more money now um, <laughs> and also a need for... Uh, a lot more capabilities for our test facility, but we actually kind of grew attached to the shipping container theme. <laughs> so our test facility is actually built out of what's the number? How many? Thirteen. Shipping? Thirteen, 13 <laughs> shipping containers that That's we had. Probably we should have picked another number <laughs> besides thirteen. <laughs> Lucky number thirteen. Well, we're adding. We're adding a couple more. Yeah, to there it you now. go. Storage. So, yeah. yeah. So it's it's built out of shipping containers, but the inside it's all drywall. We have indoor plumbing and and, and all of that. So, uh, but it's just a sea level static test facility with a thrust stand in it, and uh, you know we have fluid feed systems, um, just kind of industrial grade fluid feed systems out there and a uh, control room and some office space to work and a uh, nice deck to hang out on and oh, have a couple of beers. That's probably one of the most important <laughs> things is we have this beautiful deck that, uh, two-story deck actually, there's the, the main, you know, on the second floor deck and then there's the third floor deck um, on top of that that overlooks the airfield and there's nothing better. Then on a nice spring day or a nice fall day where it's not too hot or not too cold, is to have a nice ice cold beer and watch aircraft take off. Mm. It's the best. So the question is going to be, though, what is our shipping container going to look like when we're in the desert testing oh, water horse? Yeah, you know, like bunk beds and stuff. So like that, we do. We're not we actually leave. so we're we're <laughs> outfitting a couple of shipping containers for uh, at least our comms and uh, um, uh, being able to communicate with the vehicle. Uh, so that that'll be another shipping container theme. Uh, but yeah, that's a great that's a great question. We should definitely make some uh, crew quarters mm-hmm. uh, so that we can stay there late nights and just get some. That's that's a good point. But I'll but switching that. back, we do continue that theme as well for Notre Dame. We're mm. we're building up the capability good all in house. We've got some like it. It actually has been amazing recently seeing that all come together, building up that shipping tear so we can actually like fully execute the engine here in Atlanta in the essentially in the test facility and then drive it up to Notre Dame, connect to their facility right. and then hit go. Simplifies a lot of the operation of the integration to with another test facility. Absolutely. It's a good point. Um, is TTEB needed for engine ignition? <laughs> I'll leave it to the question. <laughs> uh, is it needed? Well, it, yeah. if he said is it needed? She or he said, "Is it needed?" It, it, it yeah. wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt. It just <laughs> adds complexity. Use it, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I love awesome. I love green flames. So I mean, that would be fun. But it is, you know, it will react with air, and it could be used, right? So. And in my previous life, I am a hypergolic guy at oh, heart. Yeah, so. that's right. Um, but yeah, Alex. Yeah, go. I mean, it, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, could we use it? Yeah. Does it make sense to use it? Uh, we'll find out when we. Yeah. Test our ignition system. Right. Well, the the fun thing is is another part of that uh, you know um, unveil portion of the thing that we discovered with the JD five is that the exhaust temperature is high enough that if you have the right requisite pressure back there, that it will auto ignite. <laughs> uh, so you know, and that's you know thirteen fifty fourteen hundred degrees at 
thirty something odd psi in the stock JD five, you know that that it'll it'll auto ignite in the right condition. Um, so, uh, although we're not specking that, right? Yeah, we're, we uh, want to be able to control yes, the ignition. Yes, control <laughs> ignition is good. Uh, so uh, you know, generally spark based ignition system. Um, yeah, and that was uh, and that was also a fun testing story too. So I'm on, you know, I have my comms headset on, and I'm standing way back there observing the engine from the back at a safe distance, of course. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember going on comms and just saying, um, "We're in AB," <laughs> and I get the response, uh, "I have not hit the igniter. <laughs> uh, we are not in AB." I was like, "We are in AB," yeah. and we're kind of having this like really concise like, argument. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, I'm like, it's I'm staring, moment. I'm staring at the flame in the AB right Right. Now. <laughs> I heard something audibly different, <laughs> and I am seeing flame out of the flame on oh, the back side of the flame holders. <laughs> Yeah, and that's where we actually get the benefit of Alex. He's got very tuned in ears oh, for yeah. changes in afterburners. Well, so. we're so old now that yeah. uh, you know our ears are shot. <laughs> I can't hear you right now. Uh, uh, can you use green fuels? Oh, this is fun. Um, yes. One of my pet interests in fundamental research is actually lower tech, lower toxicity mm-hmm. um, propellants. Uh, I, I hate the term green this is my this is my uh (laughs) my soapbox just because like if it's green it makes a horrible fuel (laughs) like it can be it can be better for the environment right um it can be less toxic but you no free lunch yeah you can't if you remove all the energy to make it green we're not going to be able to use it right yeah and something else too that i always like to comment on when people ask about green fuels um fuels kind of get a bad rap because people think of uh, the carbon footprint of a, uh, you know, an aerospace company is strictly tied to the fuel that it's using, and it's mm-hmm. this fuel like carbon neutral or uh, whatever. But that's honestly not the biggest part of the the carbon footprint of a company oh, all the right. time. So manufacturing, um, yeah. Since we're since we're actual engineers, uh, we have to think about this uh, from a whole company perspective. Like, right. what's our carbon footprint as a company? Can we be the Subaru of aerospace? Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's wh- that's where I think we can make an even bigger footprint, like bigger change is not just the miles that we fly but the pounds of waste that we generate and the energy we consume performing the the processes uh yeah that's a very that's a very good point let's see uh oh can you talk about the engine stages so i'd imagine it's just the um yeah i think we've already yeah covered we'll, that by going over the engine. yeah we'll, we'll, we'll just cover it real quick just in case we want to <laughs> post oh, okay yeah, so basically to, to summarize what we, we mentioned earlier, uh, turbine-based combined cycle, um, you know, at lower Mach numbers, we're operating strictly under turbojet with an afterburner. And then as we're accelerating through the atmosphere, we'll ha- we have our pre-cooler that we don't talk about to, <laughs> <laughs> to push the envelope as how far we will get. And then we'll um, transition to uh, ramjet mode while utilizing the bypass system, so directing the flow completely around Cocoon, the, the turbojet, and then all the way up to Mach 5. All right. Now, this one is the last one, uh, but it's probably the most contentious. Uh-oh. <laughs> not it. And I'm going <laughs> to say I'm probably not it anymore. <laughs> I once was. But who is the best tube bender? Ooh. Oh. I don't, I don't, I don't th- of, of us or at the company? It's <laughs> a good question. <sighs> I let's, guess we, let's, go with, let's go with the company. That's why it's not so contentious. Okay. Who do you think? Jordan. Yeah. Oh, Jordan? Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan's probably the best. Yeah, yeah. I think Jordan could take I me in a bend off. Although I will say <laughs> some, of our, <laughs> some of our interns yeah. uh, in the past have really shown up, oh. all the full-time engineers. Um, yeah. Oh, do, how about the... Uh, the full, the long radius bend of the fuel oh, system, yeah. that was a really nice one. Yeah, someone did about a 30-inch radius yeah. uh, bend right there. And oh, beautiful. It was, it was awesome. Yes. But no, Jordan, I think what makes him such a great tube bender, and uh, by the way. Great engineer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jordan Fisher, I'll give him a shout out so you can look him up. And just like stalk him now and ask him to, to you know, be your friend on <laughs> LinkedIn or whatever for tube bending. Um, he, uh, his attention to detail. I think is what makes him such a great engineer and uh, fabricator, like engineer fabricator, if you would. Um, he, he takes pride. He makes sure that everything is in its right place. 
Uh, he has taken initiative to, you know, hey, I see problems in this process. I, I want to fix it. So he went out and bought a bunch of tooling uh, associated with, you know, storing things in the right place and having the right tools at the right time, right when you need it. Oh, man, that's the kind of, um, you know, kind of effort and attitude that really makes you proud. Agreed. And that tube facer. Oh, the oh. tube facer. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing until recently. <laughs> that just changed my life, the tube facer. Uh, I need one for my house. I don't make tubes at the house, but I want one just because it's so awesome. We have some tools that we that make our lives so much uh. easier, and they sound like you look at it and you're like, who the heck would ever buy that thing? Oh, no. I, I was, the first thing I when we had Series A, I was like, I'm buying a Parflange 1025. <laughs> We're doing it. And then uh, I, apparently I was supposed to get a tube facer as well. <laughs> Yeah, the first time I showed Glenn uh, one of the tubes that I just run on the tube facer, um, it's just a drill with a little like cutting tool on the yeah. end of it mounted to an aluminum plate, right? Right, it just makes a very flat, nicely machined face. Yeah, and it was too expensive. And Glenn goes, I already approved $100,000 for this yeah. piece of equipment. <laughs> <laughs> it was completely <laughs> worth it for the quality <laughs> associated with that. But the next, the next big one on the tube bending front, uh, you know, since Series B is right around the corner, uh, CNC tube benders yeah. and uh, inspection equipment associated with that. That's going to be a big, fun... I mean, granted, it's probably still going to be faster to hand bend a lot of things around the facility, but I've lived that hell before of bending a bunch of tubes for a vehicle, and I refuse to do that again. And <laughs> and it's going to be very tight in quarter horse. Yes. So we got to make sure we use that volume <laughs> yes. as well as we can. Absolutely. I tell you what, just the the one hundred and fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of that CNC tube bender is going to cost is worth my employees, uh, uh, our team members, just sanity yeah. of not having to bend all of those by hand because I I've definitely spent in a previous life, you know, a month in the shop just bending tubes for a rocket vehicle and uh that was i mean it worked at the end of the day it did its job but i will not get that month back in my life ever <laughs> <laughs> how long can a team of engineers nerd out about tube bending <laughs> oh, two, oh man well, we also have a night well, i'm gonna nerd out some more we also have a nice uh tube cleaning device right that one of our interns built it was one of the coolest little gadgets that we have right it just takes some heated cleaning fluid, circulates it through the tube, and you can switch over to deionized water and then purge it out afterwards. It's so convenient. It's such a cool little thing that helps speed us up. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was proud of that one. It, it does help when it's connected in the right direction, though. <laughs> there, was, there was some time where, like, the hose was being just filled with water because it had been hooked up to go in the opposite direction. And it's like, why can't we get all this water out? And right. the designer, the intern who did this, was like, I don't know. Oh, it's backwards. <laughs> and we fixed it, and then we're like, everything was done and dried off within like the next hour, as That's opposed awesome. to taking the rest of the day. That's uh, awesome. Well, uh, we're through the questions. Any last thoughts, comments, questions, you know, whatever on testing? Parting words? Uh, I got some parting words. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, Noah mentioned we're at like 50 people right now. We are looking to grow significantly. So if anybody who is an experienced or uh, looking to become an experienced propulsion engineer, but you have solid fundamentals, please apply. We are looking to grow the entire propulsion team. Right. Uh, we have plenty of work to keep everybody busy and challenged. So yeah, that come, come join our team. Yeah, I'll second that. That's uh, you know one of the hardest things we do is hire the right people, and a lot of times you know to to your um, point there is we will take bets on right culture versus experience. Um, if somebody is crushing it on culture, willing to learn, understands first principles, but maybe they don't have the exact, you know, um, you know, new space uh, or whatever experience that, you know, with air breathing propulsion, you know, this laundry list of qualifications we'd like to have. If you don't have that, that's okay. As long as you're killing it on culture, first principles thinking, get to hardware quickly, iteration, um, we'll take bets on those people. Those people are important to us, especially in the test world of, um, you know, where things happen quick. You got to make good, rational first principles decisions uh, in a in a hurried timeline. Yeah, and a lot of people say things like, "Oh, but I've never done this before." Um, 
No one's ever done this before. Yeah, yeah. that's that's it. a great one. Yeah, <laughs> nobody's ever really. Uh, last time I checked, there was uh, you know no flying TBCCs at least publicly speaking. <laughs> yeah. Give it some time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that's most exciting about this kind of job, besides yeah. the fact that you know there's a JD five in my office. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You know anything? Uh, just doubling down on the recruiting front. Um, yeah, we've we've got a ton of good work here. Um, looking for some awesome engineers to come help us out. Well, cool. Well, that's it for us. We'll see you next time.